I think it's creepy. I think it's weird. I'll take any action from companies at this point. Look, I love love. I'm as soppy as they come. I even wrote a poetry collection literally called Bargain Bin Rom-Com. If it's tacky, if it's lovely, I want it. And I'm also not somebody who's against dating shows. Oh, Love is Blind, one of my faves. Also quite enjoyed Back With The Ex recently, but I never really watched Love Island until as somebody who is slightly panicking, <laughs> about the planet. Some videos about that up here if you're interested. Slightly panicking. I heard that Love Island was, instead of dressing their contestants in fast fashion and partnering with people like Boohoo, they were going to partner with eBay and dress everybody in secondhand clothes. Oh my God, is this the beginning of the revolution? Is the climate crisis over? I kind of felt like that at the beginning. I was like, wow, things can change. This is, this is new. Maybe I'll watch this show. So I sat down, I watched it, got a bit too into it and have cracked out my cov girl lashes again. Quite excited about it actually. It did take me about 45 minutes to attach them, but I'm loving them while they're here. So I sat down and I watched Love Island and um, I wanted to decide whether I was going to be grumpy about it and say it's not good enough or whether I was going to be like, do you know what? This is a start. So I wanted to take you on this journey, even if you don't like Love Island, you might enjoy me chatting through these goatee stra scratching questions. And I had a little bit of a research online. I've come up with three suspicions. I have three hesitations I have about being excited about this change, but in my grumpy skeptical mind, wanted to give Love Island a chance and see if they were doing this because they were also panicking about the planet or maybe there was something a little bit darker <laughs> afoot. As always, I recognize that you lot are much more sensible and much cleverer than me. So if you have any thoughts on this, I'd love to hear them below. These are just my ones at the moment, having watched about six episodes. Let's go. The first hesitation is the app. So I downloaded the app partly because I was doing research because I am a big business lady and I need to do my research and partly because I did want to vote. I wanted to interact with the show. After interacting with it for a little while, I had the following takeaways. Takeaways is about to be a pun because the first thing I noticed was that the app is sponsored by Just Eat. So eBay is one of the sponsors of Love Island, but they actually have eight sponsors in total. And I think taking a more holistic view about what who the other seven sponsors are gives us a little bit of a clue into whether they actually give a shit. Now, Just Eat, I, I, I like a good pizza, I don't mind them, but when we're talking about people to really bring up, to really champion, align your brand with, I don't know if Justy is the first person I'd think of if I was in fact panicking about the floor being made of lava. Justy, obviously, like everything that they export into our homes through all of their various retailers is all wrapped in mostly single use um, packaging. Even if it says recyclable, the very nature of takeaway food means that if you get grease on it, it ain't recyclable. So there's a lot, a lot of unrectifiable, wasteful stuff that goes into the very, the very DNA <laughs> of Just Eat. And 29% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from packaging. We know that. So that was my first whiff of some bullshit. The second one was the products that they were pushing on the app. Now, if you don't know, a lot of the revenue that Love Island get is from direct sales through the app. So the idea is that usually you'd be able to go on and see a swimsuit that an Islander was wearing and you'd be able to buy it straight away through the app. Now, this year there was obviously a clothing tab that you could go into that directed you directly to eBay, where somebody somewhere had laid out all of the different contestants and then linked them to outfits they think they would have worn, things that could were kind of similar, um, which is to be expected and I think kind of sensible when it comes to encouraging people to buy secondhand and pre-loved clothes. But it was a tab that was very far, far away. The first things that you were suggested were toiletries. They also have lots of partnerships with toiletry brands. And uh, if you watch the show, you'll know that there is a big dressing room um, for the girls and for the boys, absolutely chock-a-block with makeup, deodorant, tash waxing, whatever you want, that dressing room has it. And most of it is aerosols, single use plastic, that kind of thing. And that was what was mainly being promoted on the app when you look it up. They also, and this was the biggest red flag for me, uh, were selling their own fast fashion items on the app. Yet yeah, I kid you not, they have a bright pink robe that looks absolutely delectable, but as it only comes in one size, 
I doubt that it's gonna fit around my boobs, let alone any average or plus size woman in the UK. So that was a little bit concerning, um, as well as the other single use plastic stuff that they were selling on the app. And they also have their own branded stuff like plastic wash bags, wristbands, phone cases, and they were doing a partnership with Revolution Makeup who uh, make loads of single use plastic throwaway plastic packaging stuff. Even though makeup, I think, is one of the easiest things to package in recyclable packaging. It's not an area of hard research finding makeup brands that do make stuff in, in recyclable or, or just more reality. <laughs> conscious packaging. Now there was also a moment on the show that gave me pause and it's when one guy was saying how he's just a he's he's a guy who wears black. He like wears black all the time. He loves wearing black. That's just his thing, his thing that he's known for. The girl that is dating him is literally like, I've never seen you wear black. And I was like, hang on a second. I look back and it's true. He doesn't really wear that much black on the show. And I realized it's because Love Island have a stylist. Of course they have a stylist. It didn't occur to me, but of course they don't get to pick their own clothes. And um, the stylist for this series is Amy Bannerman. And it seems that she actually doesn't pick stuff dependent on the personality of the person, their preference. And, and she doesn't have like a different style story for each contestant. She actually just sorted all the clothes that she has sourced from eBay into lots of very vague categories. Like don't dopamine dressing, Y2K, and love me forever, which means nothing, but also explains why all of the islanders dress in very identical ways. Like I wouldn't be surprised to see one swimsuit pass from girl to girl because none of them like have a very set style of any kind or apparently get any choice in what they wear, which is fine. You know, it's, they are kind of actors. This is kind of a show, but it was also weird if I was a contestant and I was getting to know somebody and I didn't even know what their style was. I wouldn't even know what they wore day to day. I think that's slightly strange strange. And while the stylist says that all of the clothes came from eBay, she wasn't clear on whether they were all definitely pre-loved or some of them were drop shipping, which is like a big problem on eBay and reselling websites like Depop and stuff in general. So I don't know how pre-loved some of those items are, but I do know that online magazines like Closer had already made articles pointing to the fact that a lot of the swimsuits and other bits of clothes that you see the islanders wearing are still in shops. They're still available from fast fashion brands. You can still buy them and they are still linked to loads of affiliate links. So when I was thinking pre-loved, I was thinking maybe somebody's worn them for a few weeks before giving them away, but I don't know how that would be statistically possible for some of these outfits. And also I was hoping for maybe some vintage stuff, which I, ha I hadn't really seen much of yet, but uh, it's early days. I'm only on episode six at time of recording. It was also interesting for me to note that all of the Islanders wore different outfits, multiple different outfits every single day and never did an outfit repeat. Not once, <laughs> not that I spotted. And one of the core things about us being able as a community as a society to be able to give up fast fashion is getting used to seeing people in the same shit, making sure you love stuff enough that you wanna wear it on repeat all the time and not have this expectation that you need to outfit change not only once a day, but once an hour to get people to be impressed by you, to get that wow factor, to get people to like you. The second hmm moment I had was when I thought about the setting of Love Island. So traditionally it's always been somewhere hot. Living on a sea locked island means that usually the British people have flown out. This year it was Mallorca, a classic Brits abroad destination and in true Brits abroad fashion, they don't engage with the country, the culture, the language or anything. They just stay in their little villa. The biggest cultural exchange I've seen so far is two of the islanders being sent on a date outside of the villa to squeeze lemons together. Erotic but not what I'd call a cultural exchange. So the fact that they are being flown out, uh, they're all actually also being all flown out individually, <laughs> I learned, to this two and a half million pound villa that is lit throughout the day and night, it would seem. It is rigged with 69 cameras. Hey, <laughs> don't know if they did that on purpose, but my research says 69 cameras uh, and also a plethora of fairy lights, string fairy lights, as far as the eye can see, that seem to be on day and night. Lots of bird's eye view shots to show that that's the case. And the grumpy part of me, apart from it being very panopticon and like, you are being surveilled, the lights are always on, was like, do we need the fairy lights on all the time? I love a fairy light. I don't wanna be a killjoy, but all the time, even when they're asleep. So this romanticizing of hot, foreign, aeroplane necessitating holidays, this glamorizing of big, expensive luxury villas is directly at odds with how we're going to have to live in the next 30 to 50 years. And to be honest, gets people excited about something that isn't gonna be able to be the reality for most people now, and definitely not 
in the future. I will get on to how I would personally fix that later in the video, so I don't wanna be a huge grump about it, but when you do sit back and think about it, you think, hmm, don't know if getting into eBay <laughs> solves all of your problems, Love Island. But the third category in which I was a little bit like, oh, 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 oh was the treatment of bodies in general. Now, if you haven't read that much about fast fashion and stuff, absolutely no worries, but the way I see giving up fast fashion, I, I see there are two, is a two-pronged approach and a, two reasons to really think actually maybe I'm gonna sashay away from this shit. The first one is obviously the planet. It's the, the literal 3D surface that we live on, no floor, no humans. But the second reason is to me also really important is how the bodies that not only wear the clothes but also make the clothes are treated and bodies are a huge part of Love Island. <laughs> That's not a secret, you can see that in the title sequence. So I want to think a little bit deeper about how those bodies are treated. So obviously there is slightly, something slightly delicious, a little bit naughty, but I get it. In watching people who have obviously experienced a huge amount of pretty privilege their whole lives finally be dropped into a pond in which they are not the biggest fish. When some of their behaviour is confusing, I think about that fact and it makes more sense. So it's obviously delicious to see people who would normally be treated better than us because of the way they look being treated how we all feel. Nobody's attention is a given. Worried that your crush doesn't like you and that you're not the automatically the most popular person in the room just because you're the prettiest person in the room because nobody's the prettiest person in the room. They're all freaking pretty. So pretty, <laughs> especially Luca. Anyway. Focus, Lena. So this feeling of surveillance that comes with the cameras and the attention, but also, of course, being watched by potential future partners is one of the things that fuels the fast fashion industry in general. This idea that even, this panopticon idea that even when you're not being watched, you need to be ready to be watched in case somebody comes into your house and they realize that you've done an outfit repeat or somebody catches you on Instagram. Not looking like a hashtag Instabaddy. <laughs> more looking like an actual villain from an actual swamp, which is how I feel most of the time that I'm caught on camera by other people. And we know that that surveillance does have an effect on contestants, not only because some of them after having left the show immediately go and get plastic surgery, that's almost a trope now with Love Island contestants, but also that in this series, a few of the contestants got plastic surgery before even coming on the show, knowing that they would, and explicitly because they were coming on the show, they got plastic surgery before coming on. In that anticipation, of being watched and being judged. We don't love it. The other things we don't love is the compulsory heterosexuality on the show. That's a topic we don't have time to go into today, uh, but also I would note that aggressive gender conformity, even within the very aggressive hetero atmosphere in the air. Like there's not even like a metrosexual straight man among them or what we would in the 90s have termed a tomboy. Where are the tomboys? I would have cried at this point just to see a woman in a backwards baseball cap. <laughs> not a lash or a nail or a muscle out of place. I know that each individual person is their choice and that could be exactly how they want to look and I celebrate that, I'm excited for them. But as a collective, as a mood board, they're screaming playbook for the patriarchy. It's weird. It's also clear that the island is not cleansed of racial politics. That's also definitely still there. Again, not something we have time to cover in this video, but if you do want to watch one, Adela Rafida made a great video about black women within the Love Island universe. And she also made reference to this concept that she has called the first glance effect. This idea that it's okay if somebody looks good to you on first glance, they'll tick the stereotypical boxes and you know that other people will be impressed by you dating them. Uh, and therefore you're encouraged to never look close and work out whether you're actually attracted to this person or they bring anything to you or your or your life. You're just encouraged to be like, first glance, hot, skinny, blonde, pretty, I'll take it. <laughs> and also the churn of contestants, this idea, this encouragement to always be attracted to the shiny and the new, this idea of treating people as disposable feeds in to these worries that we have about fast fashion and its effect on us as viewers, effect on them as contestants and the complete absence of anybody that wasn't an incredibly rare archetype. Pinched, cinched, fertile, shiny, glowy, glossy, but never easy and never sweaty. If you want to watch a video about fat bodies and dating shows, Maddie Dreisbeck made a very good video about that. And especially when it comes to this idea of preference, when it's whether it's bodies or clothes, I also find that really interesting because some people argue like, well, you know, it's just my preference that I don't like fat people. I don't want to, I don't want to date plus size people. And that's just, that's my right. That's just, that's just how I think. But the amount of people that think like that signifies to me that it's probably not a preference. And I think Maddie said it very well when she said, our preference preferences for certain bodies often aren't preferences at all. They're just outward showcases of the biases we've learned 
over time. And not only is like this absence of anybody who has seemingly ever ate a burger <laughs> on the show probably prohibitive for the contestants finding somebody they actually love because they've shrunk the idea of who they could love into this tiny, tiny little box. But it also affects us. Like we don't see anyone being fancied who isn't the bottom scale of BMI and we think, huh, I think I might be a bit fucked. And the same with clothes. Like I think I often, when I used to buy loads of fast fashion, my, my thing was, well actually, you know, I really like H&M. That's where I find the clothes that I can express myself with. They're me. That is my preference. You can't take away my preference. Not recognizing that my idea of preference in general is something that isn't self-generated. It's usually something that has gone in subliminally. And it's also something that I can change. It's something that I have the responsibility to change if I know I'm actively hurting others. And this idea of shopping fast fashion as an exploration of who we are and our uniqueness and how we can express that, I think is weird. I think it's creepy. I think it's weird. It's something that I used to feel very deeply and no longer feel at all. And that's how human emotions and opinions are allowed to be. You're allowed to change your mind. It's allowed to flow and it's sometimes scary, but I think also ultimately productive to recognize that you aren't your preferences and they shouldn't hijack who you are. Brody Chanel made a great video on surveillance that I'll link below. But through her, I learned about Misha Kafka who talked about the changing nature of broadcasting and TV, and especially in the 80s where widespread deregulation of the market economy led to much more competition between broadcasters and therefore rising costs. Of course, you'll offset those production costs by cutting corners somewhere, and usually that's with bodies. Hiring less bodies, neglecting the bodies you already hire, and that trickle-down attitude from the 80s is still alive and thriving in today's reality TV. Let's think about Love Island and how it treats the bodies on its show. So reality TV in general, it was a great way for the 80s TV to grow and go because uh, it doesn't require any actors and it doesn't require any writers or scripters, fact checkers, none of that. That whole department, <laughs> do not need it. Now, when I went into my research, I kind of assumed that the Islanders just weren't paid at all. There is this dangling carrot of 50 grand for the couple that win. And I thought that maybe they just got away with not paying them. However, slight celebration, they do pay them. Stop your celebrating, it's 200 pounds a week. Now, when I was 18 and working retail, I would have turned up my nose at 200 pounds a week. It's not the worst, but it's definitely not the best, especially when you take into account, assuming that everybody sleeps eight hours a night, not convinced, but let's just assume they sleep eight hours a night. They're in there for eight weeks, no break. That is 896 hours in total, 1,600 pounds total for the show if you stay for the eight weeks, which works out at one pound 79 an hour. Illegal. Obviously you don't get paid for audition time and even if you do win the 50 grand, that's split between two people and accounting for that, it's 29 pounds 60 an hour, which is, it would be okay if you won. But when you consider that it is the most commercialized show on British television, according to The Guardian, and the 2021 show netted 12 million pounds before it even aired in sponsorships, before it even aired, then that starts to seem awfully like a raw deal. Even if you split 1 million of that 12 million pounds that they earn, even before the show starts, just 1 million, then that would mean that each contestant got paid 83 thousand pounds each. Still less than a politician, I think, but it, it's, it's, we're, we're erring on fair. Now you might say, but Lena, this show will make them famous. They'll be able to do loads of work afterwards. Of course they could, but that obviously depends on how the TV show represents them. There are lots of examples of unlikable reality TV stars that aren't able to make that much money after they leave whatever show that they're on. And of course doing more work that pays money is still requires more work than the work they'd already done. Done. It's incredibly emotionally intensive. It can be quite dangerous to be a public figure at that level. And of course, also exposes them to even more of a mental health minefield than they had already been whilst on the show. Of course, also movies. If you're an unknown actor and you're in a movie, it promotes your name. You can make money after you make the movie, but actors still get paid. If you were trying to make it make sense, I don't think that's the argument to go down. And I would call honestly being a worker on Love Island, being a contestant, something that is incredibly high risk mentally, physically. We know that contestants from seasons two and three took their own lives after leaving the show, as well as one of the presenters, Caroline Flack. And after all of that has happened, the show has made small welfare measures and provided a little bit of aftercare. But honestly, after reading about it, I kind of think because the exploitation is so inherent, I don't know how effective that 
would be. Love Island Zara Holland wrote a column for Grazia in which she called it a posh prison. And even though there was a lot of glitz and glamour, just reading about some of their experiences really for me evoked parallels between the nets put under factory workers who jump because their working conditions are so unbearable, the pictures of people dying exhausted on the way to work on trains, and of course all of the vital, mostly working class workers that died unnecessarily during the pandemic. If I was going to go inside the heads of producers of Love Island, I wouldn't say that they don't care about their contestants or they're completely uninterested in welfare concerns, but I would honestly say that it goes money, people, and I haven't been able to find any evidence to the contrary. Now, before I get to my conclusion, here are some things I don't hate. All of the contestants carry their own reusable water bottles, mainly to stop them from becoming dehydrated in the weather. Maybe I'm being too grateful for morsels from the master's table, but at least they weren't drinking from single use bottles and like having mountains of plastic bottles everywhere. I did like that there is a deaf contestant who didn't have to have a sob story and it isn't something that is fetishized in the show. I think that was really cool. eBay's revenue at the moment is really up, which I think is good. So I was excited to see that they even had the money to sponsor Love Island because it would seem that while Love Island is excited to work with eBay, they wouldn't have compromised on price. So it's encouraging at least to see that eBay could afford to collaborate with Ireland, and just the fact that they are doing something, anything at all. I'll take any action from companies at this point, so I'm not going to hamper my excitement too much. And also, obviously, from a class perspective, from a reach perspective, Love Island reaches people David Attenborough or Greenpeace or Lily Cole could never hope to reach. So I think it's important not to get too much on your high horse when it comes to being the person with the pure message who's doing it completely correctly, because if you only applaud people who are doing everything right, you're never gonna reach anyone. Conclusion, one of the human rights violations I don't think any of the news outlets are talking about is obviously the human rights violation that forces all these contestants to hang out with an estate agent all day. Unacceptable, nobody consented to that. But apart from that hill that I will die on, I don't want to be a complete misery gut about the show's move towards a slightly more sustainable practice. However, the moves they're making do seem to lack the level of urgency that the science points to and just their treatments of bodies in general just worries me. For me, there's no point in saving the physical planet if we're ruining and exploiting the bodies that live on it on our way there. I'm excited to see after this show has finished airing if this does have any measurable effect on people buying pre-loved clothes. There is obviously a lot of stigma and negativity around this idea of, of owning secondhand clothes in lots of different circles. So I, I want to see if that is measurable and if that does change even a little bit. Maybe if we applaud this slightly with some loving criticism, next year we'll see Love Island in a sustainable cottage in Tenby with fairy lights powered by the gym bros <laughs> cycling their way to net zero. Manifesting it, manifesting it. But it is an interesting exercise, I think, in where we give our attention, how much trust we place in people who run TV programs and how much of that actually we can probably just focus on changing stuff in our own lives and lobbying stuff outside of the realms of our guilty pleasure TV. Am I still going to watch the rest of Love Island? Absolutely. Lutely. Am I going to trust Love Island with the future of the world? <laughs> probably not. Speaking of romance, speaking of love. Don't forget I have a poetry collection coming out called Bargain Bin Rom-Com. It's very silly, it's very mushy. If you don't like poetry, I still think you might like this. I will leave the links below. If you are curious about experimenting with non-fast fashion, fun clothes, I have some playlists up here that you can watch. Have a little think in your own noggin, come to your own conclusions, hear my thoughts, they're there for you. This video has been made possible by The Gumption Club, who tip me per video so I can keep giving out all this weird free content for you. I wanna hear your goss about Love Island, what you think about their sustainability practice to just who you fancy. I wanna hear all the goss below. Thank you so much for watching. Frog Snog out.